All right, for number 17, we have a 17 kilogram child uh, descends a slide 3.5 meters high and reaches the bottom with speed of 2.5 meters per second. How much thermal energy due to friction was generated in this process? All right, so here, what we need to do is we need to figure out what's going on with work done by friction, okay? So thermal energy is really Q, right? That's how you learned it uh, in chemistry class. And that is basically negative work done by friction. So if we calculate work done by friction, we should be able to calculate how much thermal energy there is, all right? So from the definition, work done by friction is equal to right, change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy, gravitation, okay? So how much work is done by friction can be calculated by figuring out how much kinetic energy has changed, which is kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial, plus the potential energy gravitation final minus the potential energy gravitation initial. Okay. So since a child is actually sliding down, okay, so... So child is sliding down the slide, okay? So this is the initial condition. And at final condition, the child is down here traveling at 2.5 meters per second, right? So here, VF is equal to 2.5 meters per second. And we're going to assume this child is starting at rest, okay? So the initial speed of the child is zero, but this child definitely has a height of 3.5 meters in the beginning, okay? So you have to ask yourself these questions. Initially, is the child moving? And the answer is no. Therefore, the kinetic energy initial is zero. Then you have to ask yourself, is does the child have height, right? And the answer is yes. So initial potential energy exists. So there's definitely potential energy initial here. At the end, is the child moving? And the answer is yes. So there's definitely kinetic energy final here. But does the child have any height? And the answer is no. So no potential energy. Oops, sorry, I put, crossed out the wrong one. No potential energy final. Okay, no potential energy final. So we only have these two energies, this one and this one. I crossed out a wrong one here, so be careful. I didn't mean to cross this one out. I meant to cross that one out. All right, so work done by friction now is equal to kinetic energy final minus the potential energy gravitation initial. So how much work is done by friction? So here we have one half mv final squared minus mg, uh, I guess, y initial, right? So here, one half times 17 times VF, which is 2.5 meters per second squared, minus 17 times 9.8 times Y initial is the height, which is 3.5 meters. So if you work it out, I think you'll get something like uh, uh, 53.125, right? Uh, 
me see if that's correct. So you have uh, so 0.5 times 17 times 2.5 squared and 53. Yeah, that's correct. Minus this one comes out to right. Um, 17 times 9.8 times 3.5. I get 583.1. So the work done by friction comes out to right negative. So when I add these two, I get negative 529.9. Five, seven joules okay so since heat thermal energy right Q is equal to negative work done by friction it is equal to 500 I'm gonna say 30 right, point zero joules it's positive Alrighty. Any questions so far? Okay. Now let's take a look at 18. Here we have a ski starts from rest and slides down 20 degree incline, right? 100 meters long. Maybe this should be a skier. These days, skis actually have like these brakes in it, so it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always slide out. So anyway, so let's say we have a skier actually sliding down, right, a twenty degree incline. So here, this is twenty degrees. And this incline itself is 100 meters long. Okay, so I guess you could say like this here is. Distance D is equal to 100 meters long. Okay. Well, if the coefficient of friction happens to be 0 0.090, what is the skier's speed at the base of an incline? Okay. So we have our initial condition here. The skier starts from rest, right? And then starts to slide down. So initial velocity is zero because it starts from rest, right? Then the skier ends up at the bottom here, right? And then the final speed is what we want to find out. Right? There's definitely work done by friction here. So work done by friction. Right? So mu sub k is equal to 0 0.090. Right? Here, initially, Definitely has potential energy initial. There's definitely work done by friction. And here we have kinetic energy final. So we should be able to identify all this stuff when we read the problem. Okay. Therefore, we can start by saying. Okay, so the work done by friction is 
is equal to, right? There's definitely change in kinetic energy, right? Plus, there's definitely change in potential energy, gravitation. So, work done by friction is equal to F friction dot D, so dot product, remember that, right? That is equal to, oops, is equal to kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial plus Right. Potential energy final minus the potential energy initial. So initial kinetic energy is zero because we don't have any right speed at the beginning. Final potential energy gravitation is zero because we don't have any height. So frictional force, if you, if you guys remember, is mu times F normal, right? So mu times F normal times D times cosine of 180 because frictional force is acting up the incline and the skiers moving down the incline. Right? So if we were to draw a quick three body diagram of this, right? So here is the skier, let's say, right? So here's the skier. Right? So we have FG going straight down. So here's FG. Here is F normal. And here's the FGY, right? And here's the FGX. Here's the angle 20 degrees. So F normal is same as your FGY, right? I hope I don't have to like keep proving that is equal to FGY, which is equal to right FG cosine theta, which is equal to mg cosine of 20 degrees. That's what my F normal is. So we have to substitute that into here, okay? So we have to put that, to put this into here. So this is equal to then, this is equal to, kinetic energy final is one half mv final squared minus mg y initial well y initial is up here this here is y initial but how high is that y initial well the skier starts at the height of right opposite of 20 degrees times 100 right so the height h is equal to right basically D times sine of 20 degrees. So what is D times sine of 20? D is 100. Right? D is 100. So 100 times sine of 20 degrees is my height, H. So 100 times sine of 20 degrees and I get 34, so the height is equal to 
34.2 meters. So my Y initial is 34.2 meters. Now I think we have all the ingredients that we can actually plug in to figure out what my VF is. All right, so here, let me see if I can show you U mu times F normal happens to be mg cosine right, 20. That's my normal force times D, which is 100, times cosine of 180, right, which is negative 1, is equal to, right, 1 half times MVF squared minus MGH, okay? Look what happens to the mass. The mass of the skier gets all canceled out. Now we can actually put some num numbers in here. We're looking for VF, basically, right? We're looking for this. So my mu, which is 0 0.090 times 9.8 times What's cosine of 20? Uh, cosine of 20 is 0 0.9397 times D is 100 times cosine of 180 is negative 1 is equal to 1 half VF squared minus 9.8 times 34.2. Okay? So this whole mess, all this mess right here, if you work it out, I think you'll get something like um, 82.88. Check my math. See if I'm okay with that. Is equal to one half VF squared minus this mess right here comes out to negative three hundred thirty-five point one eight. So if I bring this to the other side, right, I'm going to get um, four eighteen. Point one, which is equal to one half VF squared. So my VF is equal to square root of two times four eighteen point one. Yeah. Uh, you're right. It should be negative. That should be negative. And then, then this will be this will be not correct, right? All right. So here, we go three thirty five point one eight minus eighty two point eight eight is equal to I get two fifty two, right? Did you get two fifty two point three? So hang on. So two fifty two point three. Two fifty two point three. So it should be times two and then square root of five zero four point six. So my VF is equal to I get twenty two point four six meters per second. Thank you. All right. Good. That was part A.
What about part B? Oh boy, we're gonna need some more room. So part A. Well, for part B, we have kinetic energy here now. This kinetic energy is gonna pretty much get all spent up by work done by friction until it comes to a stop. Right? So there's no potential energy gravitation initial. There's no potential energy gravitation final. We only have kinetic energy initial, which is this kinetic energy final here, in the flat part. And work done by friction is mu mg cosine theta times d, right? So for part b, we have work done by friction is equal to just changing kinetic energy, which is equal to kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial. But kinetic energy final is zero. This kinetic energy initial is the phase one kinetic energy final phase one, right? So this is equal to negative one half mv i squared, but this vi is my mean vf. Does that make sense? Because now we're in a flat part of this. But the work done by friction is mu times f normal, right? Times d times cosine of 180. But my f normal in this case is just mg because it's on a flat ground. times nu d, which is how much we don't know it's going to go this way. We know this one is 100, but we don't know how far it's going to go horizontally. That's our nu d. Times cosine of 180, which is negative 1. That is equal to negative 1 half mvi squared. So notice our masses cancel out again. Now we're solving for D. Now this negative and this negative gets canceled out as well. All right. So D is equal to D is equal to right one half. Uh, let's see. Vi squared over 2 times mu g is what I have, which is equal to 22.46 squared, divide that by 2 times 0 0.090 times 9.8. All right. So what is that? So that squared, divide that by right, 2 times 0 0.09 times 9.8. And I get 286. So you're going to go almost like three football fields once you hit the parking lot, you know. You just keep going for 286 meters before you come to, before you come to a stop. All right. questions on this? Good. Let's take a look at next one. Here, skier traveling at 12 meters per second, 
reaches a foot of a steady upward 18 degree incline and glides 12.1 meters up along the slope before coming to a rest. Therefore, let's draw this out. So the skiers coming in and a flat ground like this, and then climbs up the slope like so, right? Where this is 18 degrees. This is 18 degrees, right? So initially, the skier is actually here at the bottom, right? So skier is moving. So initial velocity is... 12.0 meters per second. So the skier definitely has what kind of energy? Good, all right. Skier definitely has kinetic energy, right? Now what? Now what? Well, skier goes up the hill, right, and stops at the top. So now the skier's at the top here, right? And it stops. So the V final is equal to zero meters per second. We gotta find out how high the skier is, right? Well, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, not all skiers are high, okay? Some skiers are high. So here, we have to figure out the height the skier gains, and this height here and this is the y final, by, by the way, right? And that is equal to this distance the skier travels. Right? And this distance that skier travels happens to be 12.2 meters. So the height is d times sine of 18 degrees, which is right, um, 12.2 times sine of 18 degrees. So what's the height? Well, the height is equal to 3.77 meters. So your y final happens to be 3.77 meters, and your y initial is zero. Okay, so your y initial is zero. So at this point, at final condition, you only have kinetic energy final for the skier. And obviously, you know, there's definitely work done by friction here, right? There's definitely work done by friction. Okay? So now we have all the ingredients. Well, then again, we have to still work out the uh, normal force, remember? And I, we did that previous problem here. So in the skiers here, right? In the skiers here, right? We have FG, right? We have FG going down, straight down. And then we have F, G, Y, right? 
and then we have FGX. This angle here is 18, and the normal force for the skier is this, right? F normal. So we know the F normal has to equal to FGY, which is equal to FG cosine theta, and that is MG times cosine of 18 degrees. So that's my F normal. All right. So now we can say work done by friction is equal to, again, change in kinetic energy, right? I guess we can do a change in kinetic energy plus right, change in potential energy gravitation, right? So work done by friction is, again, F friction dot D, right? And that is equal to kinetic energy final minus the kinetic energy initial plus potential energy gravitation final minus the potential energy gravitation initial. So we can say final kinetic energy is zero, right? Final kinetic energy here is zero. And initial potential energy gravitation is also zero because it doesn't have any height. So friction is equal to mu mg cosine 18 times, that's my normal force, times uh, d, which is 12.2 times cosine of 180 is equal to negative one half m v initial squared plus m g y final. Okay, so notice how all the masses can cancel out nicely. Now we can plug in some numbers here. So what is the average coefficient of friction is what they're looking for. So they're looking for mu sub k. Right? What is that? So here, my mu sub k times 9.8 times cosine of 18. What is cosine of 18? It is 0 0.951 times d, which is 12.2, times cosine of 180 is negative 1, is equal to negative 1 half times vi initial, which is 12.0 squared, plus, plus 9.8 times 3.77. So if you work this out right here, right, this becomes um, I get something like negative 113.7 mu sub k is equal to this becomes uh, negative 72 plus, plus this becomes 36.946 So if you want to solve for mu sub k now, right? mu sub k is equal to, right? 
this and that, and you add them up, you get negative 35.054. Divide that by negative 113.7, and you get your mu sub k to come out to 0 0.083. All right. All right. Any questions? Let's take five minute break. All right. Let's take five minute break. And then, uh... All right. You had a good five minute break there. Let's take a look at lesson five that has to do with power. All right. Power is pretty much defined as the rate of how much energy is being used. Okay. So power, so average power is work divided by time. Okay. So if you think about how much work is being done in a given amount of time, that's pretty much what power is equal to. And unit for power, right? Since work is measured in joules, Joules divided by seconds is power. They also gave this as watts. So what's the unit of power? Get it? What is the unit of power? That's not a question. That's just a statement. What is unit of power? Or power of unit, or unit for power is watts. All right? So here, if this instantaneous power is taking a derivative, time derivative of work function. All right? So this is the calculus version of power equation. So since we know work is equal to F dot delta x, if we divide both side by delta t, right, if we divide both side by delta t, this right here is power, right, that's power. However, this right here is my average velocity. So I can redefine power as, right, so this is velocity. So power can also equal to, right, F dot V. Or simply, power can be the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the velocity times the cosine of the angle between F and V. So power can be defined three different ways. Well, this is the same thing, basically, but work divided by time or F dot V, right? But this only happens if the force itself is constant, okay? force itself is constant. All right. So this is instantaneous power. And this is average power. So instantaneous power can be found by F dot V. And average power can be found by work divided by time. And the unit is watts.
So the units per power is joules per second or watts. All right, then I'm gonna, that was it for actually lesson five. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you some breakout session so you can do these two problems, okay? And then we'll come back and go over them and then we'll do springs next time. We'll do springs on Wednesday, I guess. So I don't want to rush springs. The springs can get pretty involved. So let me see if I can set you guys out into breakout session. And make it six. See if you can work on this. All right, it looks like everybody's back. So let's go over these problems. So number 20 says, how long will it take for a 1750 or 1750 watt motor to lift 285 kilogram piano to a six story window 16 meters above? Well, wow. So let's understand what's going on here. So here's the piano, right? In order to lift this thing up, it has to apply minimum of same force as the weight of this, right? So force applied has to be minimum of same force as the FG of the piano, right? The distance it lifts, delta Y, is basically 16 meters. So the work done by the motor, the apply force, has to be same as your MG, okay? So since Sum of all force in Y is equal to MAY, which is equal to zero. Sum of all force in Y is equal to F applied minus FG. So F applied must equal to MG. Therefore, right, force applied has to equal to 285 times 9.8. Well, we know power is equal to work divided by, no, not word, work divided by time. And work is equal to F A dot D, or delta Y in our case, right? So, Power, which we know it as 1750, is equal to FA, which is 285 times 9.8 times 16 over delta T. So the time for this motor to lift this piano 16 meters is equal to this divide by 1750, right? So I guess if you want to, you can say this is like 44688 over delta T. So 44688 over 1750 is how much time that it's going to take. So my delta T comes out to 25.5. That's how long it's going to take for this motor to lift this piano 16 meters. All right. All right. I mean, I guess it could take longer than that if you slow the motor down, but it's not going to go faster than that. All right. That's 
the minimum amount of time needed. All right, let's take a look at 21. Um, electric energy units are often expressed in the form of kilowatt hours. So this is a measure of electrical energy, EE, okay? A, show that one kilowatt hour is equal to 3.6 million joules. Whew, that's a lot of joules, right? So for part A, one kilowatt hour, right? If I want to convert that into energy, we know kilowatt, so 1,000 watt is equal to 1 kilowatt. So kilowatt hours is the same thing as kilowatt times hours. And we know in one hour, there are 3,600 seconds. Okay. So if we multiply this out, notice how the kilowatt and kilowatt will cancel out, and hours and hours will cancel out. This will give us watt seconds. Okay. So what is that? Well, 1,000 times 3,600 will give me, right, 3.6 times 10 to the 6 watt seconds. What? But what is watt? Watt is equal to joules per second. That same thing as saying 6. 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules per second times seconds. So notice what happens to the seconds. They cancel out, giving me 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules is 1 kilowatt hours. So 1 kilowatt hours is equal to 3.6 million joules. Now, here it says, a typical family of four in the United States uses electric energy at average rate of 500 watts. Right? How many kilowatt hour would their electric bill be for one month? So we have to find out how many kilowatt hours of electricity would they use if they use the rate of 500 watts per day, okay? So I'm gonna assume that 500 watts is basically um, How many they, how many hours they're going to actually use, right? All right. So for part B, the power they use is 500 watts per day. I'm going to say. Okay, so how many days are there in one month? So in one month, there are 3,000, no, 30 days, I'm going to say, 30 days per one month. Okay. So since there are 30 days in one month, how many hours do we have per day? There are 24 hours per one day. Okay. Therefore, 
we could figure out how many hours we have in one month. Okay, so 24 times 30 gives me 720 hours in one month. Okay, so since I want to know how much work or energy we spent, right? We actually spent, so 500 watts is the same thing as saying 0 0.5 kilowatts, right? And if we were to use this many hours in month, we can multiply that by Right, so electrical energy is equal to, this is how many hours we use, so 720 hours per one month is how many hours we use. So here, if we multiply this thing out, our electrical energy per month would be 360 kilowatt hours, okay? So 360 kilowatt hours of energy we use per month. Okay? So, for part C, they're asking, how many joules would that be? So for part C, okay, how many joules would that be? So, we know electrical energy happens to be 360 kilowatt hours. We already know in one kilowatt hour, there are 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. So we can multiply right? in uh, one kilowatt hours is the same as 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. So, since we know that, if we multiply this by this, notice how the kilowatt hours will cancel out nicely. So this times this will give me just joules. So that is equal to, I get something like 1, 1 billion 296 million joules. So 1.3 gigajoules is how much we use per month. Okay. Now obviously, this is quite not a mainline price, right? I mean, if you think about it, your hair blow dryer, like you know your hair dryers, they're like 1,700 watts flamethrowers that you use, you know? Your like dishwashers are like 1,200 watts. Your computer uses 600 watts when you turn it on, you know? And of course your refrigerators, you don't only have one, you have at least three sub-zero refrigerators in your house, right? With a wine cooler, right? So, this is completely like just, you know, peasants' usage, right? Not mainline usage. So you know you're not you're going to be much bigger than this for mainline. So let's figure out what's going on as far as Part D is concerned. 
at a cost of $12 per kilowatt hour, what will their monthly bill be in dollars? All right. Well, let's figure that out. Okay. What would their monthly bill be? So for part D, right, since they're using only 360 kilowatt hours, right, and it is 12 cents, right, per kilowatt hours. Kilowatt hours can cancel out, giving you $43.20. Come on, that's unheard of. Right? People in Texas are paying tens of thousands of dollars per month because of all that trouble they had. Uh, Pico, instead of being an energy producing business, Pico is actually in business of distributing power. So if you take a look at your parents' bill at home, you'd be seeing not only the energy cost, but underneath the distribution charge, the Pico charges. And that's approximately about 12 cents per kilowatt hour too. So if you double this, you're going to get like $85 or $86 worth of energy bill for electricity. Of course, in summer times, it's going to get a lot higher because you use air conditioning, right? And winter time, I guess you get a lot more natural gas bill, all right? So it, it, it fluctuates, okay? And then for part E. Does the monthly bill depends on the rate at which the, which you use the energy? And the answer is, yeah, of course. More you use it, more you're going to get billed for it, right? So if you use like, you know, 750 watts, right, average rate, yeah, it's going to go up, you know. If you double that, you know, you're going to double this. So, yes. All right. Any questions? All right. I'll stop the video here. I think we're done if there are no more questions. All right.